Parashat Shlach, the Torah portion of uh, Shlach 799, it's um, the one of the portion that carries a great disturbance just to read the story of the spies. I'm sure that people are familiar with that, just for the few that are not so familiar. It's an ancient story of the leaders of the 12 tribes while the Jewish people were wandering in the desert and they asked to spy out the promised land. 10 out of 12 returned with a bad, negative, evil report. You can hear a lot of scholars and historians and rabbis have a different angle of this story and how to understand it properly. Before we deal with the story, I'd like to make a very important um, declaration. The Mishnah in the chapters of the Fathers, they said in chapter 5, ten times the Jewish people test God. The Mishnah did not specify. It's only specified how God test the people ten times. However, the Talmud tells us that in Tractate Erkin, they said that it was several different tests, two, 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 and the last two, one is the golden calf, and the last one is the story of the spy. Meaning, it was a test, which again, hard for us to understand, test that the people have told God, or told the faith in God. Here is the declaration. Since I spent time of reading this portion and writing and teaching for many years of my life, I want to comment something that I heard from my teachers, may the memory be blessed, who said that we, living thousands of years after the event, and we do believe that the Torah is a living Torah, yet who we are to judge people who live in a very different life, circumstances, etc. Very different. The Gemara said, it's a famous Gemara that said, Im Rishonim ke Malachim Anu ke Adam. If the ancient people are like an angels, we are like an people. If they are like a people, we are like a donkeys. Which means, donkey, the rabbi said, sees donkeys and people as another donkeys. The only difference is donkeys see people as a donkey but only with two legs instead of four. Meaning the ability of comprehend those stories and judge those stories, especially judging history in general, in particular biblical story, it's very, very hard, almost impossible. What we can do is try to derive from those stories an application to us, to our lives. So we can take those characters and try to match them, something that reflect to our lives. But again, with the assumption that we are talking about tremendous of leadership. These are the people who jumped to the water when they, they was about to split the sea. These are the leaders who led the people at the time of desert, the time of crisis. So we're not talking about another politician that ran for office. We talk about the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes. Very important people uh, whom we are very far from fully comprehend their certain behavior. With that in mind, and with a great appreciation to each and every one of them, we can try to judge the narrative in the way that the commentators explain to us, in the way that we understand in our very best. This parasha, the portion of Shlach, is one of the portion to this very day it's a relevant, applicable portion. And I assume that everyone agree with this statement. That the key scene of these spies was the fact that they, we call it in Hebrew, Ma'asu Be'eretz Chemda. It was a promised land God promised, and they rejected what God promised. 
meaning, and you hear it from every preacher, almost in every faith group, that said the same thing. If you look at the entire Torah, and you try to find when God called people really use the word evil, it's only here. Why use the word evil? Because they are ungrateful. Look back at the diary. See. Splitting the sea. Manna from heaven. Ten plagues. All these great stories which bring us to our own life in a sense when a person is depressed, when a person is down, the person have those moments of tribulation, he or she should look back and write a small diary each and every time of things that happened for them that really um, not just special, but in a way miracle, such as I recall the time, for example, when I was in the great crisis, yet God pulled me out of that. I, I, I call the time that I get a promotion, even I didn't feel I deserve it. I remember the time that God grant me with beautiful child, with beautiful granddaughter, uh, with uh, whatever it is. Every, each and every person can find a list of things throughout his or her life that they can say clearly that this is a gift that God gave them that not even expecting that. So if a person write this list and carry it, for example, you have it next to the mirror in the bathroom, before you go to sleep you just go over the list, it brings you a different perce perception. See that it's a great greatness that God did to us. So here we are with this Torah portion and these people are the leaders, yet is not act any act of gratefulness in the, they walk into the land that they should trust God God told them I'm going to give you a, a, a land and I and I he promised them so the big point first is Rashi that said the word why God used the word lecha send forth man if you wife if you because there's no need to send spy if you trust God while you left Egypt with nothing in a sense, only whatever you take open from them, you go to unknown place just because God promised you and you see splitting the sea, you see manna from heaven. So what's the what's the real story of trusting God for the next step, which is conquer the land? Moses, however, Moshe Rabbeinu, he felt that he wants to ease it on people. Soon you see when we deal with the sentences how we try to ease it up on people. But the whole goal of sending people was in a way question of faith. Because if you really trust God, so things will work well. But it wasn't fully trust. It's a different views. It's not fully trust of people who requested. It wasn't fully trust of the spies themselves, of Moses. It's a different views what exactly happened. But the, in general term, it's the people that sent to spy out the land and return most of them with a bad report. Now, is that true in our times? How they painted the modern Israel? You tell me. Is that true that in our times you see how people view the, the Jewish state or the Holy Land or whatever you call it, the modern Israel? How some view it in a negative, some view it positive, and sometimes it's in a very unpleasant way? Well, I think in the same way that the the spies and ref, more reflected the what most of the people of Israel felt anyway because of the slave mentality of them, you know, having been in Egypt, they probably didn't have the mental strength and capability of going into the land of Canaan and defeating the Canaanites at that particular point because of because of the slave mentality. In the same way. Nowadays, if someone has a, you know, preconceived view of what they expect to, from Israel, they'll find information out there very easily that supports what they have to say. Yes. So they choose to look only at one. Yes. Yes. You you mentioned a beautiful word, which is the slave mentality. Hotzaad mm diba, -hmm. slandering, um, defaming the character, painting it in a negative way. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. The only problem here is 
you're expecting leader to be better. The whole idea of the 10 tests the Mishnah mentioned, and they said the last one, in a sense, even worse than the golden calf in that sense, but it's the last one of the least, is the whole idea of sending spies and coming back with such, because in every report you can twist. You know, mm -hmm. it's like preparing budget of a company. You know that the way that you present it can be negative or positive, depend how you play the numbers. It applies to anything that, as in the position of a leadership, you can paint anything you want. You just use the the power of words to to twist it the way that you want the agenda. So, the whole decree that the entire generation died. The Torah said that there is a result of all this crisis. We're going to read soon. The entire generation died in the desert. Was because um, it wasn't because of more echlev because they are weak in the heart. It's because they rejected what God promised them. In a sense, it's a rejection of the faith. It's the idea that they don't have this proper um, leadership qualities to go ahead and lead the people with great faith. Now, there are different views. There are some commentators who hold, and you see <laughs> the applications, that some of them figure out that if they conquer the land, what's going to happen? They will no longer be in the office. They will choose new ones. So some hold that that's the reason why they return with such a report, because they figured out, I would better stay in the desert and be in control of the people. The third Protect of their power. Own job. What? Protect yes, their right, own job. right? Rather than to, to go and, and lose the, the office. It's like always you hear, it, especially this year of campaign, you hear all the times politicians always say that my intent is sincerely for good and welfare of the people and the minutes I'll be elected, you will see a huge change in power and the policy and how people are going to treat it in the taxes and everything, right? That's usually their claim. The reality, you can basically count in one hand people who really follow what they promise, whatever the reason is. Mm -hmm. Many times it's it's a personal problem. Ah, ah. The Mishnah said, in, in, in a Pirkei Avot, the Mishnah said that Hakin'ah, the jealousy, the lust, the Hakavod, and the seek of honor and recognition bring a person out of the world. So, <laughs> you see it in this sense that um, I never understand why someone wants to be a prime minister or president of a country. I never understand that. Because if you try to think it log logically, the abuse that coming in and out, regardless to the party you belong to, day in and day out, is not worth it. Yet, you see how the Lord provided Meshuggahs people who are out of their mind, who not just run for that, who even fight for that, who even exaggerate the truth to, to get to that, and bring person out of his world. So the Mishnah said that jealousy, enviness, lust, desire, seeking of honor and recognition can drive a person out of the world. Right after my service, I have a friend of mine whose dream of life is to have a BMW Sport. So this guy worked three jobs, slept maybe four or five hours a night, until several years later he gets the money to buy BMW Sports. Does that make sense? I don't think so. But there are people who get in their mind the, the thirst for power, for recognition, that they do anything. So in that sense, this a view that's saying that they dump the whole generation, because what happened is everyone died as a result. Only Joshua and Caleb survived, but everyone else, all the ten spies, they, they are, their generation, they all perish, only their children, when they, they land. God, in a sense, said, you are, have a slave mentality, you still live in the past. You, you know, it's mm -hmm. easy to bring people out of exile, but it's hard to bring the exile out of their mind. And they're still thinking old way, you know, and they don't understand that it's a new promised land. And they are ungrateful to what God gave them. So in a sense, God said, okay, 
you're not going to make it, you're going to die here, and the next generation is going to leave them. So that's... Well, do you think it's so much them being ungrateful, or... I mean, the slave mentality sort of... I see it as what prevented them from, from really having the faith. I mean, even though they saw all the miracles in Egypt, and they saw the miracle at, at, at the sea, and so forth, you know, and, and even the, you know, the further miracles that then happened in, in, in the desert, but even with that, that was just, a, for most of them, was a small part of their life. I mean, for a vast majority of their lives, they were slaves, and, you know, in a, in a way, you know, would sort of be under, understandable that they didn't really even know Hashem, you know, and then all of a sudden, here he comes, brings them out with these miracles, well, great, but, you know, where were you for the last you know, for, for for most of my life, you know, and then, so that sort of prevented him from, um, you know, having be complete a, a, faith. It's you know? one of the views holding that way, but as I said, there are others, other mm -hmm. commentators that hold, and um, that it's the idea of being ungrateful, and mm -hmm. it's all applied to our times. We're not only thinking about the Torah story, we're thinking about our mm -hmm. own lives. Let me quote the words from Bala Kedar, Bishak Arama, who was a great sage that lived not, not long ago. We're talking only a um, little more than a hundred years ago. And he wrote as follows, Umi'ust ha'aretz, the fact that they rejected the land, hu a'inyan, that's the point, asher amad alenu lechalotenu bekol adorot, that create our self-destruction through our generation. Mm. So, and because of that, we suffer from exile out of our lands. That, that we are distanced from our uh, holy land. That we became so persecuted to others. We cannot become a full penitence to our perfect state of mind. Only when we return to the appreciation and having uh, the proper perception in about the land. So, so if we look at that point of sin, it's um, he holds that the suffering to this very day is the same problem. It's not just past; it's continuation. As a side point, while Moshe Rabbeinu begged God not to punish them too severely, he used the 13 attributes. And he said, God, God, full of mercy, etc. And then they used the word, he affected the second and the third generation in punishment. And Rashi in the Talmud explained that that's apply only if the next generation followed the mistakes and the wrongdoing of the grandfather or great-grandfather. In, in our language, in our minds, it's if people still have that mentality, if you see, unfortunately, fellow Jews that ready to almost kill or get rid of another Jew that um, have the mind of building the land or supporting the land, you know, that type of self-destruction that creates all the crisis, Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, in our parasha, he um, dealt with that very deeply. Point of departure. Nachmanides is one of the rabbis that count the mitzvah of inhabitants, the land, as one of the 613 mitzvot. So he said, look carefully at the text. Moses asked a question. Vaishlach otam Moshe latur et eretz knan. Chapter 13, sentence 17. Moshe Rabbeinu sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said to them, Ascend here in the south and climb the mountain. See the land, how is it? And the people that dwells in it. Is it strong or weak? Is it few or numerous? And how is the land in which it dwells? Is it good or is bad? And how are the cities in which it dwells? Are they open or they are fortified? So what's the purpose of uh, that he asked of all of these questions? He, even they don't respond to all of his questions, he has a very, Moses have a positive approach. How? He basically wants them to 
create a better understanding. For example, when they're about to conquer the land, he wants them to take the easy path to conquer the land. He wants to know how to get the, the people, especially all those people who are weak, the right time. So um, he did not expect them to come back with perfect answers to every question and everything is rosy. That was not his goal. His goal was that um, he asked questions, strategic questions, to help them. Um, Ramban hold that it's not that Moses was in a state of doubt. No. He, he doesn't want their opinion about the land, if it's good. God promised. It's no doubt that it's fine. The only Moses saw it as a scouting mission, not a spying mission. Correct. Yeah. Um, he said, now let me re read his word, he said, Moshe Ratza, Moses won, she Israel yatchilu miyad bepulat ha-kibush. He wanted the Jewish people to start, the, the Israelite, to start immediately with conquering the land. Right? And because God put upon them this mission, Ratza lehakel, he wants to assuage, to ease, from them, this special mission. How? He want to find out the weak point, topographic weak point, mm -hmm. the how to get the weak point of the land, and therefore, in easy way, they can conquer the land. So his purpose of spying out the land, uh, it was not a, a purpose um, that um, um, uh, of lack of trust. Right. He just want to circumnavigate those cities that is a wall city, strong cities. He wants to get to the to the place that it's easy without the big sacrifice of people. And that was his purpose of sending the people. However, the spy ignore his intent. They focus on something else or the quote-unquote quality of the land. Right. In one hand, they said it's milk and honey, but they have some objections. So let's see what happened. So they went there, and they came and they reported, 27, they reported to him and said, we arrive at the land to which you sent us. And indeed, it flows with milk and honey, and it's fruit. So Rashi see, said here something so deep and beautiful. I love this Rashi. Rashi said in 27, Eretz Zavat Chalav Rashi, it's a land of milk and honey, Kol Dvar Sheker, any lie, any time someone wants to say an untruthful statement, She'ein umrim bo k'tzat emet b'tchilato, en mitkayem besofo. How do you convince people over lie? If you start with some truth, and then in our language you exaggerate the truth, then people most probably going to believe you because you start with something that is truthful. So these spies, they start with a statement, oh yeah, it's a land of milk and honey, right? Mm -hmm. But they use the word Ephes, 28. What is the word Ephes? So let's dwell a little bit on that word. Ephes in Hebrew, in a simple way, it's a number zero. Zero in Hebrew, it's Ephes. Here they translate it as a but. The minute you use the word but is a basically contrary point. In simple way, it's a milk and honey, but here are the problems involved. So what's the issue with these spies? You can take it in many different angles and I try to combine the commentators. Some hold that all these reports should not go public. They're supposed to report to Moses, period. They make it public. That was their sins. Mm. Some hold that the report presented in a negative way. But the key point is they add their personal opinion, their personal understanding. So again, is that wrong? Some rabbis said, like, if you read the commentary of, fascinating commentary of the Malbim, Malbi was the Rabbi uh, Mordechai Levush, who was a student of my great-grandfather, the great Zidi Choiver Rabbi. So Malbi uh, asked that question. What exactly involved here? Why, why um, they are 
they are truthful. They gave the point of view. So what's wrong with giving the point because of view? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't ask for their point of view. He asked for information about the about the land. He wanted correct, but. You can say, oh, they are truthful, they, they give their view, you don't have to agree with them, that's democracy, they can give their view and that's it, right? That wasn't the job. <laughs> exactly. They are on a specific mission right. to spy out the land in order for people to enter in the easiest way, mm. period, that's their point. But they came back in a, such a report mm -hmm. that twisted everything, they said things that they wasn't asked to, they said it publicly, and they basically they took away all the morals of people. And they didn't give the information that they were supposed to give. <laughs> On the top, they didn't give the proper information, yeah. but their objections... Now, the Torah used the word Ephes. So, the minute they use Ephes, it's like, no way we can conquer the land. Um, so I'll give you an example. stronger than... Yeah, in a way, it's like... It's like um, it's like saying in they rebel stronger, against God. Yeah, but it's a stronger use than Aval would Much stronger. Yeah, okay. Much stronger than Aval because they basically they, they, they rebel against God. So um one, they say that oh guess what we see there? It was a, a we saw a, a Nephilim, a giant people. We saw the all kind of of um of things that uh, uh, scared us. They saw funerals. Mm -hmm. So the commentators said the reason they saw those funerals was because God prepared on purpose to have funerals at that time so people not pay attention to the spy. But they took it in a negative way. Another way to look at that is they just, when they soon, they start saying negative things, they go so bad and so nasty that uh, it's rebel. Because when, when they, the other two talked to them and said, Achba Hashem al Timrodu, do not rebel against God, when they use that language, it means that God is, is the one who is in charge for the war. God is standing at the front before the, the, the people. And if you fear so much, and you say they are stronger than us, it means, guess what you're saying? You're underlining and undermining God's power. Because if you said that these giants are stronger than us, you indirectly undermine the God's power. Because if God is above the nature, and if God is supernatural power that can change all the nature, <coughs> right? And the way that they describe places was mm -hmm. a very, in, in a very, uh, in exaggerated way. Mm -hmm. So, um, Rabbeinu Bachye is one of the commentators in the Torah. He said, any fear of human, especially in this circumstance, it's basically rebel against God. Because um, if you look at the story of, of Samuel and Saul, just an example in the book of, a, uh, of a, um, a Samuel, the first Samuel chapter 15. So you remember the story we read about Saul was asked to get rid of the nation of Amalek and he, and yeah. he didn't do his job. Etc. Etc. Remember that story. And all the so when that Saul came to him that. and said, "Excuse me, God asked you to get rid of everything, and you didn't do your job." What? 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 Saul answer. Saul said, "You remember the line?" He said, "Ki areti et am vayeshma bekolam." I was feared of the reaction of people, and I listened to them. Yep. So Samuel said to him, "You can no longer be the king. You cannot be the leader." Because it's good to be sympathetic to people, it's good to listen to them and hear them, but since you get a clear order what to do and how to do, what type of business is this that you're afraid of people's reaction? Um, it's basically, the, the Talmud, if you read in the Brachot 62, we just studied recently, they speak about situation that when you have some type of fear of people, it's a you have to ask the whole issue of faith in God in, in, in the sense of, of what is right. So the minister they use the word Ephes, it's like saying, come on, we cannot conquer this land. Mm -hmm. So they, they doubt the, the, the ability of God that, that, um, that he can do it. So in a sense, if you hear that from a leader, 
If you read this type of statement from a leader, so what are you expecting from people? You know, if leaders said such a thing, so um, now with your permission, I just want two minutes to read a little Zohar. Hmm? Zohar, I know it's Kabbalah, but it's just a point from the Zohar because he deals with the word Ephes. It's our make. It's so interesting because, I mean, it's a perfect example of a word that, you know, essentially just can't be translated directly into English. And no, again, it's, it's a good example like of translating how the word studying Torah, you just can't not do it without it. the Hebrew. You know, you miss so much. I mean, it's amazing. But. The Holy Zohar <laughs> said as follows in regard to the word Ephes. He said, Amar Rabbi Yose, Rabbi Yose said, Ita, I read the whole sentence, then I explain. Ita nasivu al kula la apuke ishem bish. Mai al kula al ara ve al kudsha brichu. Which means they basically defame and badmouth the land and God, both. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak responded to Rabbi Yossi and said to him, Al ara tenach. If you tell me that they said something bad about the land, I agree with you. Al brichu menayin. How do you prove that they said something bad about God? Amar lei Rabbi Yossi responded to Rabbi Yitzchak and he said, Mash madichtiv, because it's written Ephes, they use the word but, ki azaam meom yacholbo, which means. The minutes they say that they, the nation are very strong and they are giant and everything, it's basically um, disregarding God, mm-hmm. rebelling against God. So, again, there are different schools of thought. Bala Keda, Rabbi Sakharama, say that it's not absolute negative statement, the word Ephes. It's just like some type of advice that they're giving to Moses, that they don't have the authority. The concept you mentioned before that they rejected the land, I think is something also that's very important to remember. I mean, you had this gift and, you know, just not accepting a gift, you know, such, I mean, is, is a incredible the slight. Purpose. I mean, it's incredibly disrespectful to someone to not accept a gift, you know, that they give right, you. Right. So, I mean, The whole purpose, yeah. a Rav Cook, the first Rav Cook was a giant scholar. Mm-hmm. He dealt with that a lot in his uh, writings. So in one of his writings he wrote, in Orot, it's a, like Lights, one of his books, he explained that it's like three legs. Mm-hmm. Torah Israel, the Torah. Am Israel, the nation. Eretz Israel, the land. It's all Israel. Torah Israel, Am Israel, mm-hmm. Eretz Israel, the Torah, the nation, the land. It's all three legs, that it's all connected to each other. God took out the Jewish people from Egypt because they're about to receive the Torah. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't acceptance of the Torah, there is no reason to take them out of slavery. Okay. Point one. Upon receiving the Torah, they become a nation. But the completion of a nation became when they had the conquered the land and have the land. And those three entities is the core, Rav Cook said, of survival of the Jewish people. To understand that these three legs are connected to each other and they are part of entities. That it's what is the, the Jewish people is all about. And so without any one of them, you can't... The, Rav Cook holds that if yeah, you miss stand. one of them, <laughs> then you're missing the point. Yes, yep. yes, yes. And one of the things that it's always very disturbed, and I'm not taking any political side or anything like that in the modern Israel, but the whole point of getting a gift from God, and God said, it's your land, but it's my land, and they use the word my land in the Torah, that God used that word, it's my land, mm-hmm. then in a way, imagine if I give you a gift, mm-hmm. and you take that gift, and you give it away to someone, especially someone that I don't like, mm-hmm. right? So it's like slapping in the face, right? Right. It's, uh, it's more than just not accepting the gift. Um, it's incredibly they, insulting. They, I mean, it's yes, <laughs> yes. They sent out to be the emissary to spy out the land. And what happened is they became counselor, like advisor. They put themselves instead of God and Moses. 
um, um, it's like I ask you, go ahead and check uh, some suit for me, right? Um, and and um, and you go and check just uh, just uh, the suit, and then you basically um, do everything else, and and then you bring it back to me in a sense, um, something that's not befitting what I need. So mm -hmm. the point is, you don't ask for advice. You ask just very clearly to go and check the land and and um, they did something very wrong in all of their report. It was a rebel against the Torah, it was a rebel against God, it was rebellious against nations. It's a le there are many different ways that you interpret it. But the worst part is that they are majority. In the 12 leaders, 10 out of 12 say something. And it's again, it's another lesson we can learn that the majority is not always the right one. Sometimes a person needs to follow his heart because sometimes the majority are not right. So here, the beginning of chapter 14, they said that it's a national hysteria. People get out of their mind because they're stuck in the desert and they thought that they're about to die. Imagine, it's like I flew once um, to uh, the Far East, uh, was uh, flying around the Philippines, long distance flight. Uh, so I flew from Europe and it was like many, many hours. All of a sudden, at the middle of the nowhere, it was turbulence. But it wasn't just turbulence that all of you, you know, somehow experiences, in it. that was bad. In a sense, people throw up, people are on the floor, the food was on the floor, people have a hard time to to control everything. It looks like we're about to... It was very bad. And it was like about 8 minutes, 8, 10 minutes in that neighborhood. But it looks like millionaires, you know, and you sure, think yeah. that this is the time to do Vidu Yom Shema because it's a matter of minutes that it's over. Mm. And then all of a sudden, everything went fine. And everything went ba back, and they clean up everything, they set up, they take off the, the, the seat belt, and everything is lovely. Right? So, in the sense, it was a, those moments that it was a um, great test of the people. And in a sense, God was standing there and wants to see the reaction. Imagine it's like we all went to school, and when it's the time of the test, what's, what's really happened? The teacher, he or she is sitting at the front desk and they keep quiet. They usually do nothing, right? And they're just sitting and watching. Now, they taught the students. They know what they taught them, right? They knew that the students were pre well prepared. They're now just sitting and watching. God is the teacher of the world. So he basically gave all the instructions properly to Moses, to people, all they get all the instructions. What happened now? He's just sitting and watching. It's not that God ignores a situation. Mm -hmm. He's just watching to see what exactly the students does. Unfortunately, in this situation, chapter 14, the entire assembly raised up and issued its voice. The people wept that night. So it's a unbelievable, very um, painful, painful, painful um, text in the um, rabbinic writing that said that um, the tragedy of their delusion, it was a uh, very far away uh, consequences. When people were up that night, so it's a famous uh, um, statement, the rabbi said, and I quote here, they indulge in weeping without a cause, God said. God declared, because they indulge in weeping without a cause, I'll establish this night for them at the time of weeping throughout the generations. And according to Rashi in Tehillim 106, he said that night was Tisha Be'av, the nine of Av, the day where both temples were destroyed, and many other tragedies took place throughout Jewish history. Like, for example, World War I, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, uh, right? Um, destruction of the temples. Uh, uh, the destruction of both temples. There's a lot of things. Expulsion of Jews from England. It's a lot of things happened. There's a book 
by Rabbi Genut, excellent book, it's called Luach Davar Beito, which gives you every day expansion of Jewish history, by daily. It's a big book. Mm-hmm. So in that book, on Tisha B'Av, it gives you a long list of sequence events from the ancient time to our time, things that happened on Tisha B'Av. You can't say by coincidence, especially when it's at two temples, distance of 490 years between them. Mm-hmm. One temple is for 410, another temple is 420, in between 70 years. So it's a distance of 490 years, yet the same day of the destruction, it cannot be by coincidence. And it's only two temples the Jewish people have throughout the history. But that's not the only thing. So right, many it's things. many, many so more. So many things. Many more. So the whole idea is, you guys are weeping for no reason, you're crying for no reason, you're ungrateful, I'll give you a real reason to cry, in a sense. So all the children murmured against God and Moses, and Moses against Moses and Aaron. And the entire assembly said to them, Oh, if we had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had died in the wilderness, why is God bringing us to this land to die by his sword? And then they said, it, it, it is not better for us to return to Egypt. And then they said, let's uh, appoint the leader and return to Egypt. That so, happens every time they reach, came across anything tough. <laughs> they wanted to go back to Egypt. Go, go to Egypt. So that's a slave mentality. Yeah, we're brought out here to die from thirst. We're brought out here to die from by the sword. We're brought out here to... You know, just there are people, unfortunately, mm. yep. keep saying it, that it's... It's easy to bring people out of exile, mm-hmm. but in some people it's hard to bring the exile out of their minds. My previous congregation was mainly Holocaust survivors. I can't tell you, and I'm not judging anybody, who am I mm-hmm. to judge, but I can tell you how many times people still live in a camp. And I meant there are some days or weeks or months, or in one person even years of being in a camp, but they are, in a way, many, many, many years in a free country. They have no families, they have no businesses, they have no life. Yet they still have that mindset. They're still living in, in, the, in that past. i give you two small examples. Again, I'm not judging, I'm just showing with you an example. One, we have a man who was a very big builder. as a high-rise building in Manhattan, New York. Okay? We used to have a Kiddush on Shabbos, right after services, very large, very big Kiddush, beautiful Kiddush. I noticed that he used to go and open his pocket and take some cookies and put it in the pocket. And the president said to me, just ignore it, he's a survivor. And this guy, this David, have in his mind, oh, maybe, maybe I don't have food when I get home, because he's thinking he's still in a camp. Another example, it's a couple, Raz and Reuven, it's another couple. And at that time, my wife Miriam, she went to visit them. And Raz took her and she said, Oh, Rebetzin, I want to show you something. And she said, You know, I was for a long time hiding in the, in the um, attic. Because I was afraid that they, they, they whatever, the Polish people find me and... and take me to, to, to labor or to kill to kill me. So I have those nightmares. So what did she do? She have her basement filled of stuff. So she took Miriam downstairs and she showed her, you know, sugar that it's not just rotten, it's it's already yellow green. Shirts, eggs, salt, oil. Whole basement was stinks from things that million years old. Right? And she hold her hand and she said, Oh, Rebetzin, every time I come here and I see it, it gives me comfort. If it's the middle of the night and I have those nightmares, I mm. turn on the light, I go down the basement, I look at all of that, it gives me comfort. So I'm showing you an example of the extremes uh, that, that they, um, this type of thinking is still in their brain, even they are, quote-unquote, out of slavery. In that sense... It's not really right to say that it was a bad decree against that generation that they will not conquer the land. In a nice way, you can say that it's disqualification of themselves. Right. By crying, by saying, let's go back to Egypt, they show that they basically are not really capable 
of getting to the promised land. They're not ready to next step. So it was less about a punishment and more about that they just, if they some, had gone to the land, they wouldn't have been successful. Excellent. So some rabbis really hold that, um, that, um, that it was a positive thing. Um, the great uh, Rabbi Yonatan Ivish, it's, it's a great uh, rabbi of the 18th century, he wrote a book called Yarod Vash. So he holds that they are holy people, but they have tremendous fear, either fear for the holiness of the land or other fear. And because of those fears that, that go back to, those, to that, that very moment, they are basically still back in the place that they came from. They are not ready yet. Now, Think in ourselves, think our lives. I said sometimes to people, evaluate whom you are contact in a daily basis. Whom you are texting, whom you are spending time on a cell phone, on the internet, on a Facebook, or whatever you're doing, Twitter. If you want to go to the next step, the promised land that God really planning for you, think who are the people around you? Is those people are all for you or they are with you? Are those people really bring you to the promised land? Or these people are lazy compromiser, you know, people who are, have hold a slave back. mentality and hold you back from success? Because God is good and God wants to bring the person the next step. But learn from the ancient story of our people how people are really in a sense, not ready for the great gift of the promised land. And the promised land is, is so many things in our daily lives that God said, I'm ready to give you, but I'm, I, I'm not convinced that you are ready to get the gift. So in a sense, there are some times in our life we have to get rid of the, quote-unquote, those people or old friends, in a sense of, we're not talking about disconnecting relationships, but sometimes, I'm sorry to use this language, but you have to show people the door. Because sometimes they hold you back from success. In my previous uh, congregation, it was a fellow that uh, when he announced that he's leaving the congregation, I must say that it was some type of celebration. Uh, I didn't do did it in public, but in my heart I was happy. Because I never ran after someone who said, He's not happy, he wants to quit to go elsewhere. We grow because we grow in thinking further. The whole point when it's come to building future, building promised land individually, collectively, we have to think all the times how we really reach that point that we, we have the answer to all the questions in a sense. We have the real resolution within ourselves. Part of our godly is there with the promised land. The question is, if we are ready to reach that promise, then oh, there are things that hold us back. So the ten spy is an example, because the two, the minority, that small voice within ourselves, the Joshua and Caleb, these are the people who really have the vision. They can see the next step, that um, um, what they are going to. Yoshua bin Nuv, sentence six, the Kalev ben Yefune, Joshua bin Nuv, it's only these people, they spied the land, they tore the garments. So the garments is always sign of mourning, but mm -hmm. it's basically they saw what's coming, right? And and they said, "What are you talking about? It's a great land. It's a very very good, and don't rebel against God." But the result is they're about to stone them. Mm -hmm. And you tell me if that's not applicable to our times, in a sense of our nation, of our land, of our Torah. Sometimes those minority, or even within our own world, the small world, there are small voices that tell us the truth, and we just have to follow that, that truth. And sometimes it's against all the, all the odds around us. So you see the application of this is, um, is not just the history of the people, it's so much related to our times, that we have those tremendous constant challenges of all kind of people and situations, turbulence that can tear us apart. And we have always the choice to either undergo this turbulence and know that there is God most high that have the promised land for us, or to be in a state of slavery and then a person can never be out of crisis. And that's something that we should take to our heart in our personal life, how we should feel 
to full, uh, follow, I'm sorry, follow the inner voice of Joshua and Caleb. And when we follow that voice, that brings us to the promised land. Thank you.